So, hello everyone. My name is Jerome Lutz and I'm here from Munich. And to start with, actually, I heard a lot about Quark before. And basically a lot in SynBio world is about Quark because, well, Rebel Bio is doing some awesome stuff here. So thanks for having me. And yeah, I'd love to talk today about the power of recombination. Um, it's very rare that people invent something completely off the scratch. Often you get inspired by other people, by other work, and the true innovation happens when you start recombining these things. Um, recombination is also one of the biggest drivers of exponential growth. And in the recent years, many people spoke about exponential growth, but um, it's really hard to actually grasp. So I chose a picture of mine, that's me, 18 months old, and I was sitting in front of that old MS-DOS computer. I don't know how many of you have actually worked with these things, but probably quite a number of you. So that's less than 30 years ago. We had these black and white, actually green screens. And it was impossible to use, and I had no idea what to do there, but uh, <laughs> that picture somehow happened. I was attracted to that, but then there was Moore's Law. You probably all know that. It's like stated back in the 60s that every 18 months, every 1.5 years, the power of computers would double. And it happened. And it happened because, well, you use computers to build computers, to build microchips, so you let them compute. And the better you have computers that build other computers, the better your next computer is going to be. Right? That, that's the power of recombinational power at that point. And it brought us today to this. Um, that is the computer game, it's StarCraft. And that video was just released a couple of months ago from Google DeepMind's artificial intelligence team. What you see to the left is what the computer sees. That is a picture of that computer game, how the computer sees it, and he can grasp information from that. And now there's artificial intelligence programmers taking that information feed and compiling and constructing strategies on how to play that computer game. That is how far computers have brought us today. And um, if you compare it to these old screens, that's basically where we stood 30 years ago, but this time it's a computer watching the screen and giving input back with keyboard and mouse. So that's, yeah, the computer growth. And there's another picture uh, here. It's a basketball game, and I don't know how much you like basketball. I'm not the biggest fan, so I would actually put on some glasses and watch the stuff that I'm really curious about. That's nature. What you see here is actual footage of the Magic Leap artificial reality glasses. Um, you probably heard of that. You just put these glasses on, and they put computer information into what you actually see. And it works so well that you lose, you can't see the difference between what's real and what's not real anymore. And um, that's about how computers are getting into our reality. What I'm really excited about are these things, though. You've seen the presentation by Volker, and um, we've worked a lot with these guys together. They were a couple of times in our maker spaces, and actually, some people of these 20 that run the iGEM team, they're continuing as a startup, and they joined us in the entrepreneurship center I'm going to talk about soon. But what I'm really like, this, this is a perfect example of recombination. That guy who built the machinery, so it's Michael, he's 21 years old in his third semester of mechanical engineering, and he did that in a couple of months. He took this Ultimaker, which is an open source 3D printer, and um, reconstructed it into an organ printer. You don't have to invent this stuff anymore. You can just buy that for two and a half thousand euros and adapt it to the needs. That's the power of open source hardware and what happens if you recombine things that haven't been recombined before. So, um, if you would like to have the slides, you can quickly or simply send an email to go at synbio.info and a few seconds later, you will get the slides and there's buttons on the slides. You click that and you get to the website and get more information about that. Um, well, what we do is, so what we ask ourselves is where is humanity going to? And there's all these big visions out there. 
Uh, there's Alex, um, we're working together with. He's about reaching singularity and figuring out what will happen to humanity when we reach the point where computers become more intelligent than human beings. Uh, that's, <laughs> if you get into that field, you, you ask yourself some really weird questions. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what's actually the big vision of Synbio. Um, if you look on what's going on, a lot of people care about curing and reversing even aging. And, um, well, then there's also robotics, which, yeah, I'll show you in a second. What happens when you recombine these technologies, and that's our hope, is that you can come up with something truly innovative and something new. Um, these are the guys I was just talking about. To the left, there's also Philip. Philip is the guy who walks around in Munich, and he knows pretty much everybody, and he throws people together in an unbelievable way. A year ago, he ran into some students, and they were like all about the Hyperloop, and have you heard of the Hyperloop? We need to build a Hyperloop. It was 12 months later, and there's the Hyperloop. And um, he just put them together with the right companies, with the right people, and then they started to form themselves. There was 45 students working on that thing, and they just made the second place uh, two, three weeks ago in Las Vegas on the first Hyperloop test run. So that's happening when you just put the right people together. And there's, that's Alex, who's about reaching singularity and working with mixed reality, artificial uh, reality, and um, augmented reality and virtual reality. And Raphael, um, who is the dad of Roboy, that robot you see there. And well, then there's also me, all caring about synthetic biology. So the four of us work together in Munich, and I can show you a couple of pictures. Our approach is to combine tech, talent, and space. It's like the three ingredients we believe that are necessary to build our future. So I'll guide you through a couple of examples what I mean by these three things. Um, that's just a quick picture of our tech library, a small part of it. Um, this is a shelf in our labs. You just go there and you grab whatever you need. The beauty is companies give these things to us as a present because there's students working there and there's researchers working there and every company uh, hopes that people adopt their technology. So you have Arduinos, you have Intel boards, you have Joules, like all the electronic stuff that actually costs quite a lot of money. So it's, I think close to 100,000 euros that we have in this whole hardware library. But the companies gave it to us so we can actually work with it. So that's an easy access. You just go to the shelf, grab the stuff you need, and you start working. Because we want to make the hurdle to start working with tech as low as possible. That's Roboy. Um, it started four or five years ago as a research project. Now there's about 40 students and PhDs working on that robot. Well, to build a robot that's as like as a human being. It has, uh, I always forget that word. Don't say tentacles. <laughs> I said tentacles yesterday. Tensions or these things that you have like to move your hands um, and like your fingers. That's how they build that robot. And when you shake its hand, it pretty much feels like if you would shake the hand of a human being. And this year, it's the mission to make him walk. How to make a robot walk, it's really, really hard. And especially if you work with this kind of approach, you never know where your limbs currently are because the motors are very inaccurate. So what these guys did over the last few months, they took the laser sensors and the, the, the positioning system that's used in the HTC Vive. They just took apart that augmented reality glasses and extracted the sensors. They read out the sensors and reverse engineered them. So now they can produce for a couple of euros sensors that give you very, very precise laser tracking to figure out where your limbs are and to actually teach the robot how to walk. Right now we're also thinking about ways how we can bring that guy together with synthetic biology, maybe with some tissue printing, who knows where that's going to go. But um, yeah. That's the robotics section, and um, we, in the synthetic biology area, we work a lot with hardware at the moment, because we're right now about to set up our biotech lab where we can do proper biotechnology. But so far, we've been playing around with these devices, for example. This is a microfluidic device. It's called OpenDrop. It's as well open source hardware, and I'll show you a little video of that. It's water droplets flying around on the surface, and it's they're pulled by electrostatic fields. And um, what you can do is you can mix, uh, you can move a lot of liquids around. And, um, oh yeah, you made it. 
<laughs> awesome. <laughs> you maybe remember that old game from very old days. And um, the beauty is you can program these things and you can add, imagine you put a cartridge on top and you have, oh, and it makes the liquids. You can mix the liquids, you can separate them, and well, that's basically all that you do, or like a lot of what you do in the lab. And with these devices, you can automate that. You can replicate what's going on. And um, the hope is that if you have cartridges, you can have standard experiments run by this thing just by putting the cartridge on and the examples in and ready to go. Um, that's how it looks like when we work. That was at TechFest last year. Um, there's a lot of chaos. You see me there with a the printer. Back there is an OpenTron. And in the middle, we were working with microfluidics. And that's, that's how it looks like when <laughs> crazy people get together. And here's even more pictures. I would be happy to invite all of you to TechFest this year in September. Um, it's a hackathon with about 300 people. And um, yeah, there's a lot of tech around. And people come up with ideas within 72 hours. And at the end, yeah, you present what you've built. Sometimes you continue to work on your project. And it's a great and inspiring place to be. Um, we managed to get a bus transfer last time, so you could come from all over Europe by bus to Munich for free, and the tenants was free, of course, as well. Um, I wonder if there's a bus from Ireland, but hopefully we'll find a better way this time with flights or something. But it would be great if you come by. Uh, it's going to be really exciting in September. And yeah, I thought I'd show you also a little bit about Munich and uh, one more important thing, um, the CRISPR kitchen. We're going to host that event in about a month from now. We bring together 19 scientists and designers and lawyers and all different people to discuss for one whole week, where is CRISPR leading us to? What are genome, the gene drives doing if, if they happen to, to get into the environment and so on? We need to figure that out, and we need to educate people about that, but first we need to kind of clarify our mind. And that, that's what this genome hacking retreat is for, and we're going to host that. And um, yeah, oh, we'll publish the results and we'll let you know what we figured out there. And um, it's all going to happen in Munich, and that, that's also like the environment I tapped in two years ago again, and that's the um, home turf of Volker. That's, that's our campus in Weinstefan. There's a lot of uh, chairs out there, and it's all about life science. There's another one south of Munich, um, Martinsried. Um, this is like the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry there in the middle. You see the startup um, center, EZB, where you can rent um, big lab spaces in Munich. And then there's a big bio campus of, Mu of, of the LME Munich, and a big hospital as well. So that's <laughs> a lot of stuff there, actually. And um, we're just trying to figure out where, who's working in synthetic biology in that field and, and trying to bring the people together. I'll show you about that in a second. That's, that's my home place here. That's the campus in Garching. It's north of Munich. It's the classical engineering campus, actually. But the deeper, deeper we dig and the more people we get to know, the more we discover there's tons of biotechnology already there. So you, the big thing in the middle, that's a mechanical engineering plant, and there's at least uh, four chairs billion biotechnology in there. And to the top right, you see where we are. That's Entrepreneurship Center, this black box there in our biohack space. It looks like this. It's been built only one and a half years ago. And um, now there's 150 people working in this building, helping others to start startups. And then there's 50 startups, pretty much, that get, yeah, get started there. So you can just send an email, apply there, and say, OK, I need an office space. And you get an office space, and you get started. And um, you meet other people that go through the same process. And that's, I mean, you all know that in Rebel Bio, how it works. It's super important to have a great ecosystem where you can share your thoughts and share your ideas and, and, and also evolve. And yeah, in that building, we have a big maker space. There's a venture capital firm. There's these open offices. And there's even a chair that tries to research how to do entrepreneurship. And um, it's just like there was happening. Um, that's the next plans for this year and the next year. We're going to expand to other spaces in Munich and um, hopefully we're going to build a big lab as well. And we're happy to really invite you guys over and whenever you come by Munich, let me know. I'll be happy to show you around. And yeah, 
the question here today is what is our future actually going to be like and that's a question we've been asking ourselves quite often and um, I've brought a couple of ideas I ran into and when I look back you remember that picture of me 30 years ago in front of that old computer now let's look in the other direction where could that actually all go to and let's start with that one do you notice anything about that picture First of all, it's not real. And um, second, it's four women. It's actually two women having kids together. It's an art project done by a Japanese artist who ran into a scientist who figured out a way how he can take the DNA information of a female egg and put it in another one. We do that with sperm and eggs already all the time, but he figured out a way how we can do that in rats and how females can have kids. And he says, like, yeah, in a couple of years we'll be actually able to bring that to market and then suddenly lesbian women can have kids. Um, which is, at that point, I would like to highlight that art is a beautiful way to transport the messages of synthetic biology because often the science is so abstract and so hard to understand that you need visual clues and visual pictures to really understand. And what she did is she created a photo book of how a family would look like. And then she showed the book to the parents and made a video of how they would react if they would see their family. And yeah, it's, a, it's, it's completely in Japanese, the video, but if you watch it, the emotions are mind blowing. And um, it's just unthinkable so far, but when you're in synthetic biology, stuff like that becomes suddenly realistic. Um, same with that stuff. Um, it's long levity and reverse aging. I guess it's been a ancient dreams for forever, um, but now people are doing quite some progress into that area. Um, well, first of all, you age because your cells get older and everything, um, and then and you, and you can also die from diseases, of course. There's like two factors. You try to figure out all the diseases and try to fix them, but then you still age. And one approach to aging, or one theory, is that these telomeres, like you see a chromosome in the corner, and at the end of the chromosome you have telomeres that basically protect the chromosome from degeneration. And every time a cell divides, these telomeres get a bit shorter. And um, after a while they're too short and actually DNA information, necessary DNA information gets lost. So then scientists suddenly discovered in nature um, a, I don't need to know how it's called in English, in German you say Nachtmulch. It's a white, naked, pretty ugly animal that's able to rebuild itself and to um, yeah, basically live forever. It has a lot of mechanisms in that way. And they figured out, hey, there's telomerase, an enzyme that rebuilds these end caps. And of course, then there's a startup <laughs> that picks up that idea. It's called BioViva. Um, and that, that founder, she, she took this enzyme and gave it to herself. You can't really do clinical trials with that. She just tried it on herself. Um, when I say she's still alive, um, her research claims that her telomeres got longer. I must admit, I don't really know if it's true or not. But um, she's living that dream and trying out everything to make that happen. But then besides, there's also a lot of big initiatives and big money involved. There's Google's Calico. They've spent more than a billion on, on really figuring out what aging is about. It's a very long-term research project. You, if you apply to Google Calico and you get in there, you can research for the next 10 years on the biggest and wildest dreams. But the goal is clear. They want to figure out how aging works. And maybe in, in, in 50 years from now, you're old and you say, oh, that was an awesome life. I would love to start that all over again. Um, you go to your doctor, you get a syringe, and then, well, you grow younger again. Who knows where that's going? But um, it will definitely pose a lot of really tricky questions, especially if you look at that chart. It's another exponential chart. It's actually how our human popula uh, population is growing. And only in our lifetime, it will double from 5 to 10 billion people. And that's not yet incorporating all these crazy facts that we're just talking about. So yeah, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of people. There's going to be a lot of food that we need and a lot of problems that we can't even imagine yet. Um, I mean, we see some political disturbances and uh, things happening already right now because 
I believe at least, that science is moving so fast and we have so much progress that a lot of people can't actually pick up and, and, and stay up to date. And yeah, it's going to be a really interesting time, I guess. But um, we have I, like, one goal how you could solve that, or one way how you could solve that is by going to Mars. Um, I'm not going to say too much about that. There's a lot of stuff happening on this, and I'm sure you'll hear more about that in a few minutes. And yeah, but how can we grasp what the future is going to be like? How can we prepare ourselves for that? And how can we actually take part and shape it? Um, I've been asking that question quite often, and then I, I started with a, building a community around that and talking with people about this. And I'll be happy to invite you to join our community, learn and share your knowledge, and solve real problems. Let me give you a few more pictures of how I actually, how we'd love to do that with you guys. Um, oh, oh no. <laughs> it is actually. Um, if you send to go at Symbioinfo, you'll see pictures of how the community looks like. And um, so, first of all, um, you need to learn, like if you're completely new to the field, and I myself, I'm a mechanical engineer, I had to first learn the language of biology. So we developed a little tool that explains to you on websites what all these crazy terms of biology are about. And with that definition tool, you can actually understand what it is about. Then we have Symbioinfo, it's a wiki, we have about 400 pages and 10, 15 authors writing about what they're doing in synthetic biology in a language that everybody can understand. And that, that's where we share our knowledge and, and save our knowledge. But we exchange also a lot and we talk a lot to each other. And that's, that's what happens mostly in our Slack uh, community. Um, if you send an email, you can get an invite to that Slack community and talk to all experts, like 120 people right now. Um, they're happy to ask any questions and discuss things. And then, of course, we meet in person and we have a monthly meetup in, in, in Munich, London, and Berlin, and hopefully also soon Cork. But we just go for dinner and we meet like minded people, discuss things, and you don't know what's going to happen on that evening, but every time we go there, it's just like, wow, awesome. <laughs> you should try to have that here. It's just like putting the right people together and thinking about things, and then hopefully we can create an awesome future. Thank you. So, Vinny, any questions there? Thank you for that, Jerome. That was that's pretty mind-blowing. Uh, anybody got a question there? Just as regards the, um, the biohack space, um, I'm always curious about them as into what sort of limits they operate. So, I mean, both in terms of financial, so you obviously get support and there's companies giving you stuff and things like that there. Is there sort of other external sources of funding for that? And who sort of determines who can do what in there? Uh, pardon, last, one, last part was? The, the second part is who sort of sets the limits to what could actually be done in a biohack space? Yeah. We must figure that out. Um, that's, that's partly what the CRISPR kitchen is about. Um, okay, there's two parts. Let me quickly talk about the last regulation part. Um, often, like the regulation done for biotechnology, it's been like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, when the lawmakers came together and figured out what are you allowed to do and what not. And um, just a few days ago, um, the, the German regulations picked up that in the US you can order online CRISPR kits at the Odin. Um, the Odin is a biohack space online shop um, run by Josiah Zeiner and he comes up with the craziest ideas. And it's really inspiring, but he's also sending out CRISPR kits so you can do CRISPR at home. And then the government was like, oh yeah, we need to tell the people that, that it's actually absolutely illegal um, if you're not doing that in a proper lab and if you're not doing it in a um, yeah, safe environment. So um, that's also why we invited actually lawyers to truly understand to what extent are you allowed to do things. And it's not only about how far are you allowed to, but truly to understand what was the logic behind the law, because there's a lot of ethics and things in that already. And um, we will try to figure out if we are allowed to do CRISPR in cell-free systems, because cell-free systems are not living anymore. And, um, 
is that a difference there in the law? And, and these are the kind of, that's, that's how you try to not stretch the law, but truly understand it at that point. And um, to give a little excursion on, on biohack spaces, there's been like 100, 150 biohack spaces all around the world, and it's basically biologists doing experiments in their own setting. Usually you only have access to proper labs in a company or at the university. But um, to, to um, do innovation and, and entrepreneurship, often many startups start in a garage, and that, that's the garage of biologists, these biohack spaces. People with the same interests pair together and say, hey, I have a centrifuge, this old thing here and that guy there, and oh, do you have a microscope? And you get together your stuff. And um, it's been around 10 years, so then these um, biohackers, like the ones that I know well, they started to develop their own hardware. So they, they built their own microscope, they built their own spin coders, and they put this all open source, so you can download the sources, you can laser cut these machines, and then you have a spin coder that's built with a, a hard drive and um, costs you about 15 euros. So they find very clever and innovative ways to get around this expensive way. But um, I must admit, in this setting here, uh, we have great partners that, like also the companies, not only give us technology, but also support um, us financially. Because like this is hung up in this entrepreneurship center, which is actually a non-profit. And, um, which brings together startups, entrepreneurs, VC, and the industry. And in this neutral ground, um, everybody contributes whatever they can contribute. And yeah. Do you ever get the sense or even the worry that um, these companies will want something back at some stage? So, you know, obviously all major companies are, you know, interested in funding a certain amount, maybe a small amount of their budgets towards basic science. Um, but when they see the real potential of something there, that there's going to be some kind of effort to, you know, what, what do you feel their motives are, I suppose? Is... Um, I think that's what you always think if you talk about big industry, and, and uh, like also pharma and these big companies. Um, but I think it really depends on the people you work with. And um, I can say, for instance, this tech fest we were running with AstraZeneca. Um, and there's like a whole big crew of open innovation people that are really just encouraging people to work with that technology. And um, there's a lot of things that they can actually get besides IP. In fact, we say like all these events that happen there and things that happen, the IP belongs to everyone. It's often open source, not necessarily, but everybody who wants to continue should be allowed to continue. So if an innovation continues in a big company and it scales out to the whole world, fine, awesome. But um, usually it's the small teams that really commit to a mission and pursue that mission, like as you all know, like the entrepreneurs around you, those are the ones ha making it happen. And um, the big corporations, I think they've got it that that's the f future where innovation happens and that's why I'm supporting it. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? No, okay, thank you, Jerome. Thank you.